Do parents have the right to know what their kids are learning in school? Again, transparency is something that we all kind of inherently understand is a good thing, especially for a public institution. We, we feel entitled to be able to see what's happening there. On this episode, we talk with Sutherland's education expert about the issue of curriculum transparency. And we identify an approach that actually has broad bipartisan support. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Defending Ideas is a weekly podcast produced by Sutherland Institute. On this show, we are committed to renewing the principles of common sense conservatism, making you a better champion of sound ideas. Welcome back to another episode of Defending Ideas. I'm your host, Nick Dunn, and this week we're talking about education policy, specifically looking at this notion of curriculum transparency, something that's come up a lot in recent months and years in the education policy debate landscape. I think also connected largely to this idea of education choice, that in order for folks to be able to take advantage of choices that they might have in the education system, transparency and having greater awareness of what kids are learning in different environments is a key component of that. So to dive into this issue, I'm pleased to welcome back to the podcast, Christine Cook Fairbanks. She's the Education Policy Fellow for us here at Sutherland. Christine, welcome back to Defending Ideas. Thanks for having me, Nick. So Christine, we want to dive into this issue because it's something that's been debated off and on, I would say, for sure in recent months, but I would say for in recent years, uh, with a lot of the, the discussion around education policy reform more broadly in recent years. Most of that has focused on on the arguments for education choice. Um, but, but I think this idea of, of greater awareness among parents of what kids are learning in whatever environment they're in has also been a key component of that. And the first question, question I would really want to ask you is, why is this a debate? I mean, f- for me, I, we have two little kids. They're, they're still pretty young, so they're, they're a ways off of the age that, that you would typically start sending kids to a traditional K-12 public school. But in my mind, it just seems common sense that, of course, a parent should have the right to know everything their kid is learning in whatever environment they're in. So th- what, what are your general thoughts? Why has this been a point of debate in the education policy world in recent years? Yeah, so as a backdrop, like you mentioned, for several years, there has been a growing awareness of, um, you know, a parent's rights movement, basically. That includes education choice, but really the pandemic was a catalyst in a moment in time um, that gave parents greater awareness of how their students were learning um, and what they were learning. So when most families, you know, had to suddenly do school at home, they had the opportunity to see, you know, what was actually happening between teachers and students and looking at the curriculum and and things like that. So that moment in time, I think, really spurred what was already sort of this latent um, and in some ways growing movement around parents' rights. Um, And what developed was this desire to have more and easily accessible information about uh, the content that is making into the classrooms. I want to get into to what some of the arguments are, what some of the critics say it, when when they're being critical of um, uh, curriculum transparency. Uh, but first, can you talk to us about, as you described, this kind of arose recently as, as sort of part of this parental rights movement. F- for those who are very strongly in favor of curriculum transparency, what do they see or, or what do you see as the benefits of that? I guess what problem is it trying to solve? Why would more widespread and more accessible transparency in curriculum be a good thing? Yeah, so in general, I mean, especially if it's a public institution, transparency increases our trust because it increases our understanding of what's happening there. So in some ways, this is kind of relying on that instinct that we have, especially in America, of wanting to to have transparency. Um, But, you know, in in the cultural space, I think a lot of parents wanted to see um, that teachers were teaching the basics, you know, that they weren't um, sort of drifting into the more political or controversial topics. Um, but beneath even just that, there are other, you know, academic benefits for having curriculum transparent. Um, you know, there are studies that show how it can benefit students. Now, this is, you know, in the higher ed space, but when students had transparently designed um, projects or assignments, and they really understood what they were doing from the get-go. It increased their sense of belonging, their sense of confidence, 
and even understanding what the learning outcomes and skills were that they needed. Um, from a teacher's perspective, there can also be benefits, right? They preempt issues with parents that might be nervous or um, have this distrust or fear about what's in the classroom. If you can say, hey, I'm, I'm very transparent, you can look at whatever I'm looking at, it, it builds that relationship with parents. Um, but it also can help teachers focus or align their learning objectives with their assessments and activities and so on. Um, and even increase collaboration between professionals. You know, the more information that is out there, the more teachers, especially new teachers, can see um, what more veteran teachers are, are using. So that's um, so that's helpful for them. So all around, it is sort of a good practice um, to have more information available, give people context and information up front. Christine, I want to pinpoint something because I think it ties into what many of, of the critics say. And, and what I've heard, again, just sort of as, as a casual observer, is uh, people who push back on this say, well, the real motivation behind curriculum transparency is is political, or this is just another front in the political culture war that happens to be taking place in our classrooms now. And, and, and the argument these folks make is that it's sort of this anti-teacher movement to say that, well, you know, curriculum transparency, the, the critics say, is really about not trusting teachers, saying we, we have to kind of look over your shoulder and come down on you and make sure you're doing everything the right way. But it sounds like you're saying that's actually not true. It's not borne out in the evidence because there is evidence to suggest that not only is transparency good for students and, and their parents, but also for teachers. So, so can you expand on that a little bit, maybe as a rebuttal to this idea that it's, it's anti-teacher? This is actually something that, that if done in the right way, can actually be very beneficial for educators themselves. Yeah, so the concern about how this impacts educators, I think, is um, legitimate and something that, you know, I've said before that if we don't get this piece of it right, I don't think we'll get this right in general because educators are the ones that will have to sort of implement this. Um, But I think being transparent up front, again, kind of creates this um, this, uh, feeling of good faith, of uh, trust between teachers and parents that are going to have to work together as partners. Um, I mentioned some of the professional um, aspects that are possible if, if it's done the right way. Um, there's also this concern about the burden on teachers, that they are already doing so much, and that's true in so many different areas that the profession has changed, that it's very, um, that it's that it's uh, burdened by things that are beyond teaching, right? You know, you have to um, understand what's going on emotionally with the students. And um, so part of this is also making sure whatever policy comes out of this, that it's not adding, but um, giving greater purpose to some of the work that they already do. One of the other criticisms I hear is is this idea that, well, we already have curriculum transparency. So how, how would we reply to someone who says, well, you're pushing for something that exists. You, you can access these things. Is that true? And, and, and if so, is it accessible? Like help us understand, I guess, the current landscape and if it's accurate to say we already have it or, yes, we actually need to expand and improve curriculum transparency. Yeah, that's right. So in, and this is similar to in the education choice debate where people would say we already have choice, but it was clear that people wanted more choices. Um, and I think it's the same thing here. I think there are a number of teachers that try to be transparent. We have a lot more technological tools that are available that allow parents and teachers to communicate in real time or more frequently. And um, so those are tools of transparency. Now, whether or not there is a widespread use of them or even um, sort of financial incentives or whatever to use them in a certain way, um, those aren't existing in a in a widespread um, way, especially in our state. So I think there's a lot of room to increase transparency, even though you might say some are doing it well or that we have tools available to do it. So with uh, we ran through some of those those criticisms that fo- folks make again, whether it's is it motivated by sort of political culture wars, uh, this argument that well we already have transparency, so why do you need more? And then you talked about the burden on the teachers and and also kind of this this signal that, well, if done the right way, this actually can strengthen teacher trust. Is there anything else that we ought to be aware of in terms of what what the counter arguments are out there to this push for cur- curriculum transparency and maybe the the right way to respond to it? How, how can we answer those? As you said, some of those concerns are legitimate. Um, how can we answer those appropriately? While, again, sort of reinforcing this idea that this this is about something that you've written about before, you've said before, strengthening the parent-teacher partnership 
um, you know, strengthening this sort of collective focus of helping kids learn? Anything else that we need to make sure we understand in terms of how best to respond to some of these criticisms that we might hear? Yeah, so certainly the way you go about it is going to matter. I mean, there are some people that are fearful that this is just a censorship of teachers, that there's going to be surveillance of teachers in some heavy handed way. Um, I think that those sorts of things can be ironed out again in the public policy process or law making process. Um, certainly there are going to be limitations on how transparent you can be. You can't uh, know every single thing that a teacher will say in a classroom, um, but you can do a lot to understand and give parents information and equip them. Um, you can also stay away from, again, heavy handed um, uh, enforcement lovers, and you can maybe incentivize teachers to do this. And so I think, you know, again, public policy can have a wide range of um, tools, carrots, sticks, um, and, and, and that will matter as well as far as the teacher burden is concerned. Christine, the last question I want to ask before we go to a quick break, and then I want to dive in more to, to some polling data on how parents feel about this issue, how, how, how voters here in Utah feel, and then also talk through, you know, maybe some policy approaches and how we ought to be thinking about it. Um, but first, as, as we begin to wrap up this first segment, I really want to focus on this idea of kind of broad reform to the education system, because, it, again, as an, as an observer, sometimes it seems to me that that any time there are ideas that are proposed that would maybe lightly or significantly change some things in the education policy landscape, there's just a lot of reticence toward th- those things, whether it's fear or, or I don't know, sometimes it seems like there's just a lot of resistance to change. And I'm curious if, if you've picked up on that as well. And, and if that's true, if this is sort of a policy area that, that there is maybe a lot of resistance to, to change, has, has that resistance changed, I guess, in recent years post-pandemic where there's just more appetite for maybe thinking about things a little bit differently to be responsive to the needs of parents and students? Well, I think a lot of people, just in general, maybe human nature, don't love change because there's a lot of unknown and concern about what it could mean. Um, but I, I do think, and again, I'll go back to what I said sort of at the beginning, that the, pande- the pandemic really did um uh, changed so much i mean there was a unique opportunity for parents to even just be more directly involved in their students education for a moment in some ways to see that they could be more involved or uh, that they could make different choices and so i think that in general just culturally politically um there is a space for people to consider innovative ways of approaching education and to uh, challenge the status quo, you know, uh, certain things didn't work when um, we were in an emergency situation. So we're willing to address those and look at those. So um, I think it's a good time for people to look at reform and to be open to it and see how we can address. I mean, at the very least, we're dealing with some significant learning loss because of the pandemic. And that's required in, in an infusion of, um, you know, funds and uh, different ways of looking at schooling. Well, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I want to go through some of the survey data and ask you to respond to it to, to help demonstrate the, the interest level, I guess, among likely voters here in Utah in something like curriculum transparency expansion. And, and then also get your thoughts on what would a good policy approach look like? What would be a framework for, for policymakers out there who might be interested in this, who want to advance this? Because it sounds like what you were alluding to before is there's there, there are some correct ways and maybe some flawed ways to go about this. We want to make sure we get it right. So let's jump into all of that right after this break. You're listening to Defending Ideas. We'll be right back. Sutherland Institute is an independent, nonprofit public policy think tank based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Our mission is to defend the principles of the American founding and strengthen the institutions of civil society essential for those principles to endure. Sutherland provides research, events, and multimedia to policymakers and the public to promote the principles of faith, family, freedom, opportunity, and responsibility. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org.
Welcome back to Defending Ideas. I'm Nick Dunn, and we're going to continue our conversation about curriculum transparency and this broader push in the education policy movement to, to try and enhance and expand the level of access that parents have to transparency in curriculum for their kids. And we've been talking with Christine Cook-Fairbanks, our Education Policy Fellow here at Sutherland Institute, about this. We're going to jump into some polling data to help shed some light on how voters actually feel about curriculum transparency. But first, I want to mention quickly, if you like what you're hearing today, please visit us at defendingideas.org. You can get access to this episode, previous conversations, and also find short clips on YouTube and other channels that you can share on your social media channels in your conversations about these issues. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, all the major platforms, wherever you like to get your shows. Just look for Defending Ideas and click the subscribe button. And also you can watch on the Sutherland Institute YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe. And also click the little bell icon in the corner so you get notified each time a new episode drops, which is every Tuesday morning. Access to all of that and more at defendingideas.org. Christine, I want to continue and and I want to dive into a reference and issue brief that we produced from Sutherland Institute recently called Support for Curriculum Transparency. We'll include this in the show notes for everyone as well so you can refresh on this on the survey data. But we, we asked likely voters here in Utah about just generally how they felt about curriculum transparency. And, and I want to mention a couple of, of the findings, the percentages, and get your thoughts on them and, and see how that should influence how we think about this issue. Again, whether anyone listening is an educator themselves, parents of school-age kids, or policymakers, and of course for all of us as voters. And so a couple of, of, of stats to reference. Of the likely voters that, that we surveyed here in Utah, when asked if they if they supported requiring schools to share grade curriculum with parents, 77% said yes, they would support that requirement. 79% said they would support rewarding teachers for sharing lesson plans with students. And 63% said they would support requiring teachers to share lesson plans with students. And, and so first, I, I want to point out that specifically with, with requirements or incentives, I guess, put on teachers, that there's 79% say, yes, we support rewarding teachers for sharing their lesson plans with parents. But then that drops to 63% who would say we would support requiring teachers to share lesson plans with parents. What do you make of that difference? That there's a, there's a It's still a strong majority, but there is a significant difference between rewarding or encouraging or incentivizing teachers versus requiring teachers. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think it shows that Utahns get it. I mean, again, I think that they are sensitive to teachers and what they're saying consistently, which is that the profession has changed, they feel overburdened, and so people don't want to, uh, in the face of that, just continually give them mandates and requirements. However, they still want an increase in curriculum transparency. So if there's a way to reward them for doing it, incentivize them to you know, voluntarily take um, extra steps to be transparent, then they're even more supportive. Um, and I, I think that that's probably uh, the right instinct from Utah voters on this policy. You know, one of the things that stood out to me when I first saw the survey data was that that 63% of Utah likely voters who say they would still support requiring teachers to share lesson plans. At first, I would think, well, that's still a majority. You know, would that still be a good policy, you know, to pursue? But to your point of, there's much more support beyond a supermajority for rewarding, incentivizing teachers. And what you're saying makes sense to me that this it's this idea of however we pursue this, we should be doing it with the acknowledgement of the workload and the burden and the stress placed on teachers because they're such an important part of of the education system and teaching our kids. And, and maybe another point to that to get your reaction to as well, Christine, when we break out these this survey data by a political party, it shows some interesting breakdowns as well. So again, those two questions of, of whether we should reward teachers for sharing lesson plans or require teachers to share lesson plans. For, for just rewarding, incentivizing, encouraging, rewarding teachers for, for curriculum transparency, 77% of Republicans support it, 85% of independents, and 68% of Democrats. So that, that is 
super majority support among Republicans, Democrats, and independents for rewarding teachers for sharing their lesson plans with parents. But then when you ask about requiring teachers, it's still high among Republicans at 73% and rel and high among independents at 67%, but among Democrats it drops to 29%. So uh, maybe it does it kind of bolster your argument that look, there if we can reward and incentivize that not only does that have supermajority support overall, but also you get bipartisan support. So that's kind of the winning policy approach is that in my mind that should neutralize a lot of the debate and argument because there's broad bipartisan support. W would you agree with that or, or what context should we add there if we're going to pursue this? Yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly right. And um, and I mentioned earlier how you go about a public policy is just as important as sometimes the details of the public policy. And I think that's right here. Um, curriculum transparency has sometimes been seen as this. Uh, it's a conservative issue. But I think that if you view it in the right way, I think a lot of families, regardless of their perspective or ideology, um, would prefer to understand what their students are learning, um, so long as we're not harming or uh, creating, you know, extra stress for teachers that are trying to do this work in the first place. And, and again, we'll, we'll link to that issue brief in the show notes because there's some other interesting breakdowns. We won't go over all of it right now, but that looks at family structure, income level, gender. And again, it's one of those issues where there, there's pretty strong, broad support. This is an idea that's broadly popular. But again, to your point, Christine, the way we go about promoting it or trying to implement it in policy is going to be really, really important. And, and that's one of the things I want, want to ask you about is, is sort of the, the, the other components involved with this, because my sense is that we wouldn't want to just go say, hey, we're, we're going to implement a curriculum transparency policy in some form and then kind of say, hey, mission accomplished, we did it. But one of the things I've heard you say before, Christine, is, is recognizing the, the important involvement that parents do or, or should bring to the table in terms of their kids' education. And at the beginning of the episode, you mentioned this sort of parental rights movement that's picked up a lot of steam in recent years. And I want to ask you about the other side of the coin is, is parental responsibility. What do you view as the responsibility on the parent side when it comes to transparency? Yeah, data will show over and over that parental involvement in their child's schooling has clear impacts on their achievement, on their behavior, on their motivation. So any way that we can bolster and support and facilitate parents getting involved, I think is uh, well worth our effort uh, in public policy. So um, curriculum transparency has the potential to um, catalyze or underscore and help parents that want to be involved, but maybe are already addressing some other hurdles. Um, there is recent Gallup uh, polling data that shows that parents feel like there is insufficient um, involvement from parents on attendance or helping with homework um, behavior. And so that's that's pretty insightful that there really is a gap and, and a need for parents, at least from the teacher's perspective, which I think is actually fairly persuasive, um, that parents in a lot of ways aren't doing enough. And so so you're right. Whenever we talk about rights, then we also need to talk about responsibilities. Parents have a right to understand what's happening in education because they have the um, the right and the obligation to do so. Part of that is stepping forward and making sure that they're being helpful and constructive partners and using what is um, available to them. Part of that might be an awareness issue as far as um, what information already exists, um, but but certainly we can we can do more to um, I suppose, encourage parents to, to get involved. Christine, it seems to me like almost parents and teachers l largely want the same thing because if, from that polling data, if you have teachers saying, we really want more parental engagement with, with, with their kids who are in our classes, like, yes, parents, we, we want you involved, we want you engaged, please come, come in and, and engage with, with, with your kids' education. And then on the other side, if you have parents saying, you know, we, we want to be engaged, we, we just don't know how, or, or maybe they might see an obstacle or barrier in place. Shouldn't that be the makings of sort of, again, this consensus common ground approach of if all parties agree that engagement from parents, and, and again, the, the thing that you've said and written about often, this, this parent-teacher partnership, um, that 
that should be the common ground. And then now we're just figuring out, okay, what are the best policy levers to, to encourage that, to make that as easy as possible for both parties involved? Is it, am I oversimplifying it? Because it seems to me like, well, that's the answer that that should solve the debate. This should be sort of a consensus issue from now on. It's hard to to feel like being transparent is 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 too simple because it seems like it should it should um, make sense to a lot of people. But in implementation, it can be tricky. So we've talked about how it can be tricky for parents, uh, for teachers, but for parents as well. What really holds them back from being involved? I think that there's um, a mix of reasons. So it can be. Uh, just time constraints. I think most parents can uh, relate to that. It can be the parent's education level, their um, lack of experience within the school system. It can be a language barrier. It can be a culture barrier. It can be family structure. All those things sort of uh, can come together in a unique form for each parent, but can be significant barriers to them understanding. So what can you do on the public policy side is you can try and make the information as easily accessible as possible and as digestible as possible and make it um, consistent throughout the state. So there is sort of this expectation and they can anticipate ways that they can get involved. Uh, understanding what's happening in the classroom would be a big part of that. That, that actually leads perfectly into to one of the final couple of questions I want to ask you before we wrap up. And that and that's the policy side. What What is the right policy approach? If, and I'll frame it this way because I always like kind of raising the stakes a little bit, I guess. If, if Utah's governor, Senate leadership, House leadership walked in and sat down and just said, Christine, we've seen your stuff. We love it. We want, we want to do whatever the best thing is to do on curriculum transparency. Let's throw in state school board, principals, district leadership, teachers, whoever is in the room as far as the folks who would actually be implementing a policy like this. They all come to you and say, this is a great idea. How do we do it? What's the best way to do it? What's the most important first thing that we need to look at from a policy standpoint? What would you say? So some of the details can be left to the lawmaking process, but I think an important framework would be to have a financial or professional incentive for, par uh, for teachers who voluntarily choose to go the extra mile of doing a couple things. Um, creating transparency, sort of a preview of the entire year of what that's going to look like. That allows parents prior to a school year to make choices uh, that would be best for their student. Um, and then using some sort of um, learning management system or a platform like a Canvas um, system that allows them to post day-to-day -day learning activities and objectives. That also allows teachers to be uh, nimble and adjust based th based on the student needs throughout the year. And then also create some sort of awareness for parents. That would be a key part of communication between um, parents and teachers. And I think a lot of teachers will say that they try to do that. And again, that's up to the parents to uh, take the baton from there. But I, I think you would need all three of those pieces, you know, a preview, a day-to-day -day piece, and then also awareness for parents. And and let teachers decide if they want to pursue those incentives. It makes sense for them, and it can only, I think, benefit their students in the long run. Christine, that, that actually prompted another question I want to ask, and, and obviously because we're in an election year, um, voters and policymakers um, are, are very cognizant of how, how people feel about these issues. Do you have any sense of, I know we went through some of the survey data showing the support, but what would you recommend to, to policymakers who are, you may be up for re-election or, or those seeking office and, and as well as voters who are about to, to go and fulfill their civic duty as voters on this issue. It, do, you, do you have any sense of, of if this issue is something that is going to be a factor in, in elections this year? Is it something that voters should care about when they go to cast their ballot? Is it something that elected officials should be willing to prioritize when they're looking at subsequent years of service through re-election? Any sense on the, on that? Does does this factor in at all to, to our election season right now? Well, I don't see the, the parents' rights movement slowing down. Um, and so I can only anticipate that candidates will make it part of their platform and, and they will continue to talk about it. So I think people need to understand it. Um, some of the, the polling that Sutherland Institute has done has also shown that it's a... Um, it's one of the priorities, sort of a mid-level um, priority for voters, but certainly um, there on their radar. 
And so I think candidates would be wise to also understand that people are caring about this issue and want to want to see what this could look like. So absolutely. And I mean, an election year only adds um, momentum to issues that people already care about because they give it airtime and they want to explain why it matters to them. Christine, the, the last question for, for each of us, for, for all the folks listening to this conversation, the I think an important question is, okay, if I'm out and about and I'm, I'm talking with somebody about this issue, whether it's a, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a family member, in person, on social media, at work, whatever the environment is, if, if, if we are out there and we hear someone being very critical of, of curriculum transparency, maybe echoing some of the things we mentioned at the beginning, how how should we respond if 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 this is something that that we believe in that yes this transparency push is important and it's going to be beneficial what are some of the key messages that we need to to focus on to be able to to defend this idea productively in a way that can actually resonate with folks who might be persuadable um to to be more drawn to curriculum transparency what what are some give us some good talking points we can use if we find ourselves on these kinds of conversations in an era where there is um, decreasing trust in public institutions, including public schools, um, there's also data to show that the satisfaction that people have with public schooling has dropped significantly in the past 20 years. Um, there's something that needs to happen. And I think transparency can be part of that um, response. So if, again, transparency is something that we all kind of inherently understand is a good thing, especially for a public institution. We, we feel entitled to be able to see what's happening there. Um, and I think that it's public schooling is an institution worth um, saving and improving and uh, developing trust in. The majority of students end up there and, and choose to, to learn. And so we want it to be as um, functional as possible. We want parents to have a wonderful relationship with public school teachers, and that's all to the good of the next generation that's entering those doors. Well, Christine, I, I think we can leave it there. We'll link to, to the issue brief, also some of your recent writings on this topic um, in the show notes, so folks can go and read those and, of course, share them far and wide. But I want to thank you again for letting your time and expertise. I, I think you're right that this the, these issues, these movements, um, the, the momentum around this isn't going away anytime soon. But it's important that we're thoughtful and that we get it right when we implement it. So I want to thank you for sharing your time and expertise on curriculum transparency here on Defending Ideas. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Well, we're going to take one more quick break before we leave you with some final talking points. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Stick around. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with the latest policy debate that affects your life. The solution? Subscribe to Sutherland Institute's weekly newsletter, where you'll find in-depth insights from seasoned policy experts, compelling multimedia, and advance notice of special events. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. Before we go, there are a couple key takeaways that I captured from our conversation with Christine that I think will help each of us be more persuasive champions of the idea of curriculum transparency. And that's this. The main message to me, I think, is that we need to articulate that we should support education reform that elevates the importance of parental involvement in education while making it easier for parents to be engaged, while also strengthening the partnership between parents and teachers. We shouldn't be pitting one group against the other. We should be talking about these things in a way that can strengthen both parents and teachers because they're both committed to the education of their kids. And also, we can recognize that curriculum transparency is a tool that can help accomplish that, especially if done in the kind of thoughtful way that Christine described in our episode today. Well, that will do it for us. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you feel better equipped to defend some of the ideas we discussed today. If you want more access to Defending Ideas, please visit defendingideas.org or search for us on Apple, Spotify, all of the major platforms, wherever you like to get your shows, you can subscribe to Defending Ideas there. You can also subscribe to the Sutherland Institute YouTube channel. And if you do, click the little bell icon on the corner so you get notified each time a new episode drops, which is every Tuesday morning. Again, that's defendingideas.org. And lastly, if you want to support the broad work of Sutherland Institute, please visit sutherlandinstitute.org donate. That will do it for this episode of Defending Ideas. Thanks so much for being with us. 
From the Sutherland Institute in Salt Lake City, I'm Mick Dunn. We'll see you next time.